our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, when we think about the book of Acts, there's some special events that usually kind of jump out at us, like the, the ten plagues or the Passover, the parting of the Red Sea, the Lord giving the commandments to his people at Mount Sinai, the people worshiping the golden calf. Over the next couple of months, as we walk through the book of Exodus, we're going to be focused not just on those big events that happened, but most importantly, focused on the deliverer, focused on the God who comes and saves his people, walking along with the people as they intimately began to know the living God, to know the God of mercy and grace, the God who was slow to anger, the God who was abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, the God who would be their deliverer, who would redeem them from all that they were going through, through all of the oppression. And this great event in Old Testament, this great delivery event points forward to the greatest delivery event of all, God delivering all from the oppression of sin, death, and the power of the devil through the cross and the empty tomb, through the salvation that comes through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But God, as he delivers his people, he delivers them not just to set them free, but for a purpose. The purpose is for them to know him, to have a relationship with him, for them to worship him, and then to be a part of the mission and the ministry, to be witnesses, just as God has saved us also for a purpose, to know him, to live in a relationship with him, and to be his witnesses in mission and ministry. So when God saves, when God delivers, it's not for us just to be blessed, but it's also for us to be a blessing. To others. The book begins where Genesis ends, with the children of Israel, the children of Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, the children of Israel in Egypt. And they went there because of the great famine. Joseph was already there. He became second in command during the time of, of, of good uh, produce. Tons of food was gathered and stored during that seven years. And now during the seven years of famine, they all moved to Egypt. As time passed on, Joseph and his brothers all passed away. So did the king who knew Joseph. But the text also tells us that the people prospered, and that was the promise God made to Abraham, you will become a great nation. And as the people began to prosper, the pharaohs worried. And one after one, as they put them into slavery to try and contain them, to try and keep a hold on them. To, and they put them into forced labor and made them build their cities and work in the fields. And then as time went on, as they continued to grow and prosper, then there was the Pharaoh that said, we need to start killing off the baby boys. And gave the command to the Hebrew midwives that when a baby boy was born, they were to kill it. And then the command to all the Egyptians that when they saw a baby boy, they were to throw it in the river. So not only was there this hardship of the hard work they had to do, but also the oppression that was upon them. That here, an event that was to be joyous in their lives going through a pregnancy was something that was filled with fear and for some even dread. That the joyous words during delivery, it's a boy, for some were not joyous words. What's going to happen to my son? What's going to happen? And so this horrible agony 
in which the people were living. And in the midst of this, a boy was born. His name was Moses. And his mother was able to hide him away for three months. But after three months, it got a little bit harder to hide him away. And most parents will tell you, is the older they get, the louder the cry, right? It became harder and harder to hide him away. And so she put him in a basket and set him out into the river. And God, in his protection and watching over Pharaoh's daughter, or sees him and knows it's a Hebrew child but wants to raise him as her own. But the sister of Moses is there to offer help in his being nursed and being raised until the time comes for Moses to go to the palace and to be raised with the Egyptians. Time passes quickly in just a few verses because the time goes quickly that now Moses is 40 years old and he's observing what's happening to his Hebrew brothers and sisters. How they are being mistreated and one even being beaten. And Moses tries to take the step of being a leader without the direction and guidance of God. And it turns out badly as he ends up killing an Egyptian. And when the other Hebrews hear about this as Moses continues to try and be a leader, they reject his leadership. What are you going to do? You're going to kill me too? And then Pharaoh finds out about this and Moses has to run off to the desert in Midian. And while he's there, he becomes a shepherd. And another 40 years passes as he takes a wife and as he has a child. Chapter 2 ends with the children of Israel in the midst of their agony, crying out to the Lord. Now we hear those beautiful verses about our Lord. God hears them. God sees and God knows. He hears their prayer for help. He sees what has been happening to them. And he knows what they've been going through and the agony they have been experiencing. But you know what? God has already been at work. Even before they cried out, God was already at work. He knew what was going on. And God was protecting them. In the midst of all of the oppression and the slavery and the demands to put the boys to death, they continued to grow. They continued to prosper. The midwives didn't do what Pharaoh said to do because they trusted in God. And God blessed them and their families as well. And they continued to grow as a great nation. And God protected and watched over Moses, one who he was preparing to be a leader. Even in the midst of their agony and oppression, God was already raising up a leader. And we're going to hear more of that in the next couple of weeks. As God has prepared Moses and then will call Moses to be a leader. So in the midst of it all, even before they cried out, God saw and God knew and God was at work. Because in the midst of difficulty, in the midst of oppression, in the midst of struggles, our God hears our God sees, our God knows. So we cry out. We do. We cry out. Because crying out is an act of trust. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. No, we, we may not be held captive in slavery and forced to work long, hard hours 
And we may not live with the threat that our children might be put to death. But there are things that hold us captive. There are things that hold us down and oppress us. There are things that cause us fear. There are things that even terrify us. The fear of being told that we have an illness or a disease. What does that mean? What's the future going to be like? Being in the midst of life that can be sometimes just absolutely overwhelming. How can I keep up with it all? How can I get it all done? The fear of going forward another day in life without someone we love dearly because death took them. The fear that comes when finances aren't so well. And then it's compounded by the fact that so many things were lost and broken in the earthquake. The fear of guilt. Guilt over things we have done in the past that we're ashamed of. And why did I do that? Or guilt of I should have done more. How come I didn't do more? And for many people right now, the fear of going to sleep at night. Will we be woken up again like we were two weeks ago? And being held captive and wondering, when will I be able to sleep like I used to? We may not be held in captivity of slavery, but there are many, many things that frighten us, that hold on to us, and we cry out. And we have a God who hears. And we have a God who sees. And we have a God who knows and understands and is concerned about us. But we have a God who is not way up in the universe kind of looking down at everything that's happening and going, oh, that's pretty bad. We have a God who came down. We have a God who came into our world in the person of Jesus Christ and lived among us and with us, and experience the things that we go through and knows firsthand what life is like living in a broken world. And we have a Lord and a Savior, Jesus Christ, who lived in the midst of this brokenness and allowed himself to be broken on the cross for us. He gave all. For us. To restore us. To give us hope. Give us forgiveness. And life. And love. And he invites us. To know that love. And to know his forgiveness. And to know the hope that can only come from him. The deliverer. In the midst of what we go through. Day in and day out. As we live in a broken world. He's our victor. He's our savior who promises to be with us. The people of Israel cried out, and the text tells us God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Our God is our covenant God. And that covenant relationship is God is our father who cares for us, who provides for us who knows what's going on and is there for us. And so Jesus says in our gospel lesson today, when we're caught up in worry, he says, why are you worrying? The Father knows what you need. The Father knows what you need. 
even in the midst of their anguish and the midst of their oppression, God was already at work. And even in the midst of the things that hold us captive, God is already at work. He is. In the midst of this, God was raising up Moses. In the midst of things that are going on, God raises up people to help us, to support us. Do we always recognize that? Do we understand that? When we're going through struggles and trials and challenges and difficulties, do we see the people who come to us and say, how you doing? As people who are sent by God, who have been raised up by him, who say, how can I help you? Or the people who come and just spend time with us. God at work. You know, the ministry of the comfort dog, that's actually a pretty new ministry. It's only been going on for a few years. And so many people were blessed by the comfort dogs being here. God knew an earthquake was coming. And he'd already prepared in advance the help to come. And the many people God has already placed in our lives who are looking out for one another, who are caring for one another, God is at work in the midst of it all. He hears. He sees. He knows. And our Lord Jesus walks with us through every bit of it. And he seeks to remind us of the promises that our God makes to us. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. Call upon me in the day of trouble and I will deliver you. Our Lord Jesus, he says, come unto me all you who are weary and I will give you rest. Our Lord who says, I am the good shepherd. I lay down my life for the sheep. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. And nothing can snatch them out of my hand. As the things of life in this broken world try to hold us captive, we need to remember who's holding on to us. It's Jesus Christ who walks with us day in and day out. Jesus Christ who through his blood shed upon the cross, has brought us into a covenant relationship with our God, who forgives us our sins, who restores our life, who gives us hope. And as we're going to hear about the children of Israel wandering through the, the wilderness and eventually headed to the promised land, Our Lord has been our deliverer and is our deliverer and he walks with us through the wilderness of this broken world and he will bring us to the promised land, to the heavenly home where there will be no more difficulties, there will be no more problems, there will be no more tears, there will be no more pain, no more agony, but we will live forever in the perfect presence of our God. We long for that. We pray, come Lord Jesus, come. But as we wait, he does come. He is with us. And he walks with us every day to bring us his love, his hope, and his forgiveness. And so we trust in a God who hears and a God who sees, and a God who knows. Amen. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We worship the Lord with our tithes and our offerings.